Good morning, everyone. Um, welcome to the FERSAT Annual Review 2021. Uh, we haven't had this review for more than a year due to the unforeseen circumstances with, uh, with COVID. And we also had to uh, postpone the Zagreb CubeSat workshop. That's more than a year ago. And uh, we are going to merge those two events in today's event. Uh, where we will give you an update what has been going on with our satellite development and uh, curriculum at FAIR and the Department of Communication and Space Technologies. I am Professor Dubravko Babic and I will give you an introductory lecture where and then after that we're going to have other participants in the program talk about their respective topics. So I will start with an overview of the project, then uh, Jakob Tutavac will describe our current work on the payload, uh, then Dr. Yurica Yuritz will talk about mechanical and thermal design, uh, Assistant uh, Professor Josip Lonchar will tell you about the development in um, attitude determination and control systems, uh, and finally Dr. Josip Vukovic we'll talk about the ground station and the efforts in controlling our satellite from uh, from the earth or talking to our um, satellite we may have other contributions that is yet to be seen and um, i will also at the end uh, before closing remarks will tell you a little bit more about the curriculum and the new profile of uh, at fed so that is the end of that okay so this is the overview presentation uh, that I'll show you. First thing that uh, you need to know about a satellite is that there are two functional parts to it. And I'm drawing here, this is a 1U satellite, 1U CubeSat, that means 1 liter, 1.3 kilos. Uh, here is a 3D printed version, you can see the bolts and this is all plastic. Uh, and it is divided into two sections. This is actually a FERSAT uh, model. Uh, there are two parts. One that we refer to as the bus or the platform, and the other one is called the payload. And uh, the payload is the part that has, that does the function that you want the satellite to do. And the bus is everything that satellite needs to be able to live in space. For example, out here are the solar panels, which, uh, which provide the energy from the sun. Inside there is a battery. Inside, there's a central com onboard computer, and there's also a system that ensures that the satellite is turned around towards the Earth if you want to take a picture or talk to people at the Earth, uh, on the Earth. So that's called the, orient the in creation, that's orientational of the satellite, or it's called attitude control. First, you need to determine what the, the way, the, in which direction the satellite is oriented. That's attitude determination. And then you need to move it. So you will hear more about that in a later lecture. Uh, the point of this is that the, the, the bus is something that you need for the satellite to survive, but it does only the minimum functions that you need to survive in space. When you typically, when you ask the question, what does your satellite do? That refers to the payload, because that's the useful load that does some measurement or uh, takes pictures or sends data to Earth, uh, specialized say, uh, data to Earth. I forgot to say that the bus also contains a communication module which talks to a ground station at the Earth. You will hear more about the ground station later, but there's going to be a, an extra uh, UHF antenna on here, which is not shown on this picture, which talks to the Earth. So, uh, satellite development in at FAIR uh, there, are, there are many people, about four, at this moment, about 40 um, employees of FAIR and uh, students participate in this project. So both students and faculty get practical experience directly on topics related to building a satellite. We refer to that as the FERSAT program. Uh, the, uh, we've never done this before, by the way. FAIR has never built a satellite before. So this is the first one, and as you do the first time, you learn a lot of things. So both faculty and students learn together here. 
to build, what does it take to build a satellite? The objective is to offer a number of features to amateur radio, uh, um, amateur, amateur radio users, which is going to be, th these are some of the functions, right? So uh, the, the first amateur radio function is going to be repetition of messages. It's a known technology. This is part of the bus. It's actually implemented as a software feature in the bus. It has to do with radio amateur users. Uh, they send a message to a satellite, and that satellite message gets relayed somewhere else, which is uh, in a di different place on the face of the Earth, where you wouldn't be able to get to because of the curvature or the lack of the ionosphere, or it's too far, or signal is too weak. So the the, um, the radio amateurs in Zagreb have been doing this for a decade now. So we are planning on adding this repet repetition. Uh, this is software implementation, software implemented receipt and sending messages out. Uh, these are optional. We're not sure yet that this is going to have happen. On-demand image capture retrieval in a 10.4 gigahertz amateur radio channel, um, or using using the 10.4 gigahertz um, channel, or UHF as a back, as a backup where you could demand a picture taken somewhere else over Rio de Janeiro or so, and then uh, you get that picture downloaded to your station. In addition, the payload uh, will include some remote sensing technology. Remote sensing is a term um, that refers to, to um, making measurements somewhere far away, like in space, or making measurements deep under the ocean, or somewhere out there where humans don't go. It's called remote sensing. So we are doing two things. One is light pollution, right here, and ozone sensing using ultraviolet uh, light. Both of these are in progress today, and we, you will hear more about that in the, today's uh, uh, presentations. Finally, we are looking all to space-only applications, but they are second priority. That's the first satellite. We need to minimize the risk and do this uh, as soon as possible, maintaining quality, all right? So then you, you have to make a, um, what's called a, a down, uh, down, uh, downstream. Um, I'll figure out the word in a second. Okay, so ozone and these two things are going, but higher applica high space-only applications are second priority. For example, the magnetic field and electron density in the ionosphere. We are today. Are, these are only partly partly baked ideas. We haven't developed this fully. Some of them will be worked on such as the ionosphere, uh, measuring electron density ionosphere. Uh, magnetic field we're probably not going to work on because it's not practical. But these things are looked into for future functions, for future payloads, not for this satellite, for future satellite. These are investigated for FERSAT today. Uh, how are we developing this or how are we funding this? We have multiple creation industry cash and in-kind donations. Uh, uh, Ultima Pregrade is probably the, the biggest contributor here in terms of cash and in terms of work, working with us, collaborating. Croatel Zagreb, Geolux Samobor, and we had, um, we worked with the faculty of uh, mechanical engineering as well. We had a grant from Gratian Science Foundation that funds hardware components and publication costs, and now is funding one graduate student. Um, uh, sorry, a different HRZ grant funds of one graduate student on a full-time basis. There is no overhead in, the, in this. This project doesn't for, provide for any overhead. That means that the burden is on the faculty to do all the administration and to use their time, their spare time, to work on this project. None of us get paid extra from this project, okay? Uh, there are multiple factory, uh, faculty members are involved on a part-time basis, as I said. What all of the work on the nanosatellite and payload developments is done by students. So that means um, that we really like you to join and help out. Uh, we do the management. Some of the graduate students do the management. Some of the faculty do the management. Students do the work. They learn a lot of things. Uh, I will talk more about that. 
and they do start early. We have uh, most of the students' interest we get is from year one and two. So don't be shy, come over and during your first year, second year, start early. It takes a while to learn a lot of the details that are necessary for a satellite. Although in the end, it turns out to be a technology that you would learn at, uh, at the school anyway, except this is a very interesting application that has some extra features relative to what would you normally do. There are other departments that uh, are participating in this project. We have active collaborations with Department of Communi this is us, Department of Communication and Space Technologies. We work very closely, we have uh, uh, courses together with the Department of Applied Physics, Department for Elect Electronics, Microelectronics, Computer and Intelligence System, as well as uh, Department of Electronic Systems and Information Processing were all participated or the collaborating in this effort. Uh, outside of the universe, outside of the Faculty of Engineering, uh, we, we have good contacts and collaborate, discuss things with three different ra amateur radio clubs in, in uh, Croatia. One of them is the uh, Faculty of Electrical Engineering, that's up here on the 13th floor. And also the faca Faculty of Mechanical Engineering and Naval Architecture, as well as Faculty of Science. So it is a wide collaboration, although most of the work happens here. So um, talk about development of a or building a satellite. The first CubeSat uh, and uh, the, the CubeSat format and the um, the, the cassette into which you put satellites when, they're, when they, um, there's a cassette that gets mounted onto a rocket that goes, it's a launch vehicle that goes up into space. Uh, that, bath, that cassette will hold three 1U CubeSats or one, one CubeSat that is length of three units. Uh, that happened around 20 years ago in California. It's a joint collaboration between Cal Poly San Luis Obispo and Stanford University. That has enabled, <clears throat> that has enabled the uh, uh, d dramatic lowering of the price of the, the um, extra secondary load on these large launch vehicles and enabled universities to participate in research, developing tools for measurement things, uh, measurement for remote sensing basically actuators, measurement, thing, measurement gadgets, and so on. It's, it has been very productive in the last 20 years. But um, we're a latecomer to this. We started uh, three years ago, so we are a latecomer, and, and the, we have to account for that somehow because the, the commercial landscape has changed in terms of what can be purchased and what has to be made by ourselves. So. Uh, it takes universities on the average about seven years when they started to develop the entire satellite. But that was you know, from times when they would uh, develop every part, every part of it. Today, th the landscape is different. And today, uh, the pe people who take satellites to space, they consider one U satellite a toy, right? You can build many, you can take one, uh, depends on what you want to do. The point is that you can today buy a lot of the parts that go into a 1U satellite, especially those parts that go into the bus, into the platform. Those can be purchased. And that is very good because there are quite a few, as I said, quite a few manufacturers of components for CubeSat that exist today. And hence, building and launching the satellite has been become within the financial reach of universities and small companies. One of the business models today is a small company that wants to sell data about certain particular problem that, or, or a feature that happens around the world, uh, will commission a different company. So company A will, needs, wants to sell data. In order to get the data, they need a satellite. So they go and commission a satellite builder, company B, that just makes small satellites, tell them, please build us a satellite that will measure or take pictures of how many ships leave Hong Kong Harbor, for example, 
any other harbor to be able to immediately, very quickly, get data how many ships move and how much goods or how many containers move around the world. That information is valuable to certain people, certain companies, you know, commodity traders, bankers, or so on. So that company A, which I just mentioned, is going to pay money to a company B to build a satellite, build the payload and the bus, send it to space, capture the data and keep on shipping that data down to, so for company A can sell the data. Notice that company A has built, launched a satellite, but they've never seen the satellite. They don't need to see a satellite. But that, that is the case today. You can build a satellite, a small CubeSat, send it to space, call it your satellite, but um, you never have to see it. So um, that's how the landscape changed. But then the question is, well, what's the point of selling a satellite if you're just going to buy everything? Well, we're not going to buy everything. We're only going to buy what can be bought. But there are certain things that cannot be bought because we're doing their original work. And as I mentioned, and, and I will talk about it more, the, uh, the certain um, payload functions such as uh, light pollution measurement, ozone measurement, you know, Nobody's done this in some small for, such small format. Therefore, those are, that's original work that we here at FAIR are developing. We can't buy that. We have to build it ourselves. So if you come to work on FAIR site, a FAIR set, um, you will most likely work on things that are, going, that are going to go into the payload. Not, not 100%, 70%. So, um, as I explained, the key realization of what I just talked about came around two years ago when we decided that uh, we shouldn't be building the bus. The bus can be purchased. There is one other aspect of purchasing a bus that is very important. Uh, reliability of the satellite in space. One of the key problems in, in, uh, in uh, satellite, small satellites is that they fail before they fall out of orbit. And they fail because they're made poorly. They haven't, you know, they have weak, weak parts. They, they uh, simply stop working or it, it is not unusual that the satellite will never wake up once it's launched. It just never turns on. So what you want to do, make sure that we buy if you were to build a satellite, you want to make sure you buy high quality components that have either been proven in space or are well made in such a way that they will last for a few years without failure. So it's a risk mitigation strategy to buy, uh, to buy commercial parts for the bus and then focus and pay all the attention on the quality of the payload that we need to develop. So that is what we're doing. Uh, <clears throat> so our, as I mentioned in the last minute, is that the fair selected payload should contain new technology, and it, is, it does, that we can't buy. And that is also intellectual property. Some of the things we're working on are going to get patented. Uh, this means that FAIR cannot buy it, we have to build it. So I'm inviting you to participate in original development of space technology with us here under the FERSAT pro uh, project. So here is a quick rundown of the known parameters of the FERSAT project and the FERSAT satellite. It is going to be a 1U CubeSat, one liter, four thirds of a kilo weight, right? The orbit is gonna be circular sun synchronous orbit, inclination, not almost polar, not clear yet. It's going to be about two year, two to three year life expected. That's theoretical. Attitude will be, altitude will be about 500 kilometers. That's the target. Those are the most common attitude, altitudes. The orientation will be various. We will be controlling this with the, with the bus that we're going to be buying. Uh, ADCS will contain a magnet torquer and very likely will contain the um, uh, reaction wheels of which you're going to hear more about later. The communication 
four commands and telemetry. This is the minimum that you need to have for a satellite that comes with the bus, as it says here. 435 megahertz and amateur radio frequency will be used for telemetry and commands. That's part of the bus. And a 10 gigahertz expand data download technology demonstration. This will be used as a technology demonstration. Uh, it's a, also an amateur radio channel. Both amateur uh, bands are uh, going to be um, qualified here, or actually will get permits for both bands. Temperature, the, instant, the instantaneous temperature target for the inside of the satellite will be 5 to 35 Celsius. This is predominantly uh, controlled by the battery. Battery is the problem. Battery, you cannot freeze it and you cannot cook it up too high. Other things live. Electronics, you know, that goes way to negative and goes up high, but uh, the battery is the problem here. So our target launch here is sometime during 2023. Let me uh, get back to the topic of uh, life of the satellite. And here is, a, here is the, the pressure in Pascal pressure as a function of altitude how high this is in kilometers this is a thousand kilometers that is 100 kilometers notice the uh, that the uh, there is a so pressure this is a logarithmic graph so so mind the fact that there is a dramatic drop here really fast drop around 100 kilometers or 80 to 100 kilometers when uh, Richard Branson went up to space they went to space they touched space they went 50 miles up which is about 80 kilometers they did they they left the atmosphere came out here where there was no atmosphere above them or very negligible atmosphere the sky was no longer blue the sky was black that means to reach space right so this point here now if you go further up the international space station is at 400 kilometers the atmosphere here is very, very faint, 10 to minus 5 Pascal, right? N notice that the one atmosphere is about 100,000 Pascal. So looking at 10, the 10 orders of magnitude lower, or even more, 12 orders of uh, magnitude lower pressure out here where the ISS is. And our satellite will be at 500 kilometers, which is around here. Well, this is very low, but it still produces atmospheric drag and it slows down your satellite. It's slowing down the International Space Station. That's why every now and then they have to lift it up. They, they lift the station, uh, but 400 kilometers is a good, good distance to take good pictures and study Earth. We're going to be at 500, right? So that, what that does, it slows down your satellite. And as the slowing down goes on over the years, it's keeps on dropping, right? And as it slows down, as it keeps on dropping, it speeds, down, speeds up towards the Earth, hits, starts hitting the atmosphere, warms up, and burns out. So by sending a satellite up to 500 kilometers, we're not adding to the space debris. We're not adding trash. After three years, this thing will fall, burn out, and it will vaporize. Basically, there's not going to be any, anything left of it. So here is the, so w once you know this number, you can estimate, and this is a curve that I made. I'm not claiming it's accurate. It's very approximate, but gives you an indication roughly what, what the expected life in orbit in years looks like as a function of uh, attitude, altitude, sorry, altitude, right? So if you look at uh, 500 kilometers, you will be looking at about two to three years. Now, there is an agreement among, among many countries now to prevent the, that one of the ways they're going to prevent space debris is by limiting all the small CubeSat satellites to maximum height of 650 kilometers. What they will ensure is that within 25 years, that satellite will be gone. Right, so you will see that CubeSats will go into this range of distances, you know, between 500 and 580 and rarely close up to here. So they will eventually burn up within 25 years, they will be gone. So that is one way of ensuring that we don't leave trash in space above Earth. 
There are CubeSats that are out here. That was before the agreement was made, right? So SwissCube, which has been more than a decade up in, in, in space, they're at 700. They'll, they'll stay for a long time. They still operate. They operate like a Swiss watch. Okay. <clears throat> So I just ex explained to you that uh, drag is what slows down the satellite. But statistically, that's not the main cause for satellite, end of life of satellite. Uh, what happens actually is that there is temperature oscillations and radiation will damage your environment, will damage your electronics. So eventually, you might just stop working because dam radiation has damaged your electronics or battery and so on. So, but if you, uh, one interesting thing that I will mention to you here is that when, radi when you look at radiation and temperature, you expect that the longer the satellite is in space, the worse things are gonna get. You expect that the failure rate is gonna increase because there's more stuff coming and hitting the satellite. So, um, this makes one expect that the hazard rate I don't know if you know what hazard rate, it's a terminology, it's a term from, from reliability engineering, or it's called the failure rate, would increase with time because there's more and more radiation. But it turns out that's not what happens. Uh, there is evidence to the contrary. The reliability of spacecraft is known to be plagued by early failures. So chances of, lo of getting your satellite to fail within first week actually higher than having it fail in those extra two years. It's called early failures. It is a, it is a, uh, it's a part of a, a known theory of uh, electronic or electronic or optical or mechanical uh, devices called reliability theory. So most CubeSat missions, for this reason, are planned only for a few weeks. You know, I just told you that the satellite will live two or three years. Sure, but the smart people plan missions only for a few weeks. Go out there, do the measurement, and then forget about it. Or not forget about it, but in terms of uh, get what you, uh, you, you show what you promised has worked. They don't generally promise two years of measurements. They promise two weeks of measurements because most CubeSats are not intended nor designed to withstand long periods in space. It's likely they will die. So let me show you what the um, proposed functions of FERSAT were, and I'll give you a little story so you understand. It's actually quite important you understand the sequence of how ideas went through. So when you hear that some idea has been thrown away, you understand why that was done. It's not that the project is failing, that the project is doing exactly very well what it's supposed to do. You're supposed to down select and select the things that you know are going to work. So when we started, we had lots of great ideas. We wanted to make measurements of the Earth's magnetic field. You needed very sensitive magnetometers available. You can get them commercially. Measurement of the electron density in the ionosphere was a pretty good idea. Still haven't resolved it, how, we, but we figured out how to make a miniature and light elect, electron energy spectrometer on board. Note that this is, there is no need for vacuum, right? If you make an electron, electron sp spectrometer, a mass spectrometer today, you need to make a vacuum, right? Because electrons go in, you don't want them to hit uh, air molecules, but you already are in a vacuum of 10 to minus 10. So let's take let's take advantage of that. You already have vacuum, so you can come up with ideas what to do, what to measure something that for which at the earth, on the Earth you would have to have a vacuum. Vacuum comes up for free, almost. Then we were planning on identifying light pollution sources on the surface of the Earth with a camera because they were readily available. Or we could use a miniature linear CCD spectrophotometer available commercially. And we developed, or at least we thought at that time, we could develop an unmixing algorithm. We did, okay? So this has been done already. But this was the story two years ago, three years ago. And uh, so that means that we were planning on taking pictures and using a spectrophotometer from the orbit. Furthermore, Searching for ozone holes, it turns out that the first person who measured the 
ozone uh, column, his name was Dobson, and he used a particular kind of interferometer to do that. Uh, that measurement can be done from the Earth to uh, measure the ozone column in Dobson unit. What we did is we decided, well, we're going to adopt that idea and do the measurement from a satellite with two filtered detectors in the ultraviolet domain. Uh, finally, we would implement an X-band transmitter for sending an images and payload. And to do, that, was, that was pretty challenging because, to the best of our knowledge, no one is using a 10 gigahertz transmitter on a 1U CubeSat. Advantage would be 8 megabit, megabits per second rather than 9.6 kilobit per second, kilobits per second that you can get in the UHF band or the VHF band. We would have a camera to take pictures day and night, and we have a UHF repeater for amateur radio. For most CubeSats, allow radio amateurs to, to uh, communicate. So those were the ideas, but after 12 months, we uh, realized that some of those things were simply, simply not practical. So we had to make a down selection of things we believe that are actually, that we could make in a reasonable amount of time and that it would work in the end, that we could provide the quality, right? After 12 months, we came a down selection. Known in the industry, when you are developing a new product, you start with two or three different technologies. You invest six months, a year, to investigate what those two things can do. And then at one point, point you did a disciplined, planned step. We say, I'm gonna pick one of these. So we picked those that can be built. So first question is, is the implementation practical? If not, the idea could either be placed on a back burner, do it for the next satellite, if you need more, or completely scrap it, right? Or completely scrap. So we completely scrapped magnetic field, and we placed the, um, we placed the uh, uh, electron density measurement uh, on the back burner. And then, so the second tougher uh, criteria was, could we produce a working payload prototype and integrate it with the bus in 2021? All right, so we're halfway. This is a tall order. In order to do this, we, we seriously cut down and we left with this set of things. Repeater, camera, sensor module, which measures the, both uh, the ozone column with the Dobson interferometer and, and uh, light pollution, and we kept still the expand module. One watt we needed to do. So let me just explain some of the work on the expand module because it's a pretty interesting, very difficult uh, part of this development. The idea is that your satellite circles around the Earth and you, you have a UHF channel that talks to it while it's passing your, your antenna, which, of which you will hear more about later. You track the satellite. The satellite can be rotating in pretty much any direction. You can still talk to it because the directivity of these antennas is not, they're, they're not only directional in the sense that they emit in all directions the same. They don't, but the difference between the lobes are not that large, so you can talk to it regardless of how it rotates. And then that is 9.6 kilobit per second. This communication with, a, with a, another dish antenna here, we have plans for one small, one large. That has to be turned, you know, the, the satellite has to point over here to get the connection to work very well. So this part is the, this ground station. You will hear about more in a later presentation. This, I'm not going to talk about at all yet. That is future, OK? But the work is quite demanding. Here are several students. They need to <clears throat> implement the antennas, circularly polarized patch antennas, electronics at the back of this uh, PCB here. They've developed everything. They planned this. Here is a transmitter at 10.4 giga, 10.5 gigahertz. Each of these pieces here, RF power amplifier, driver amplifier, mixer, lo local oscillator amplifier, local oscillator and variable attenuator, and then the low pass filters, 
that th there are DACs in here. These DACs in a low power field programmable uh, um, gate array has been designed software written by students. I'll show you these examples that we are, this is what they look like. This is all different blocks that the students built on this project. There's a mixer, there's a power amplifier, local oscillator, and the controller for everything with the power supply lines. This is a off the shelf, off the shelf um, field programmable gate array. That is your IQ DAC, uh, and this is a PCB, interposer in PCB that the students built. So, um, made very good progress here. Uh, the VCO runs at uh, 10.45, and uh, here are 10 megabit per second QPSK modulated signal. Uh, number of students developed and tested out antennas. This is an older one, but we have at least four or five different new designs that are being explored for this, for this purpose. Very interesting work. This is solely driven by students. They investigated, they found components, made the printed circuit boards, designed it, and tested it. You get to learn a lot of things when you do that. Uh, and um, a lot of experience with RF mic and microwave electronics. Although it is all still on printed circuit boards. You don't have to make a chip on silicon or gallium arsenide to learn and make things like this work. It's a lot cheaper to do it on printed circuit boards. Let me switch the topic um, with another function of the payload, which is light pollution. Uh, I will only make an introduction, and then Yakov Tutavats later will give you a bigger, longer presentation so you get to see what, where we are today, and so on. So uh, what is light pollution? It is direct or indirect introduction of artificial light, which means man-made light, right? into the environment. Uh, there are negative effects which, first of all, include wasted energy. I mean, if you're shining light into space, you are really wasting that energy. Um, there is, a, there is disrup disruption of astronomical observations, and I'll show you the next slide how that manifests itself. And it's, it has harmful effects on humans uh, because it changes its circadian, the circadian rhythm of animals. So how does it manifest itself? If you're on the face of the Earth, you, if with, with no light pollution, there's a little house there, a little bit of light, but you can see the sky, you see the Milky Way. If there's a lot of light all around, you get this glare and you don't get to see the stars. That's when you go down to the coast, you enjoy the, the uh, nice views of starry nights, which you don't get to see that often if you're a, in a large city. So light emitted from the artificial light sources on the surface gets back reflected or diffused by particles, dust, water, and so on. Now, you can also see it from space, right? So here's an image that was published about a few years ago. If, this is not, if the light is not scattered towards the Earth's surface, then light is emitted into space. And this, these pictures show you how well illuminated Europe is relative to, let's say, this part of Africa or the Himalayas, right, which is black. You can measure light pollution from, from the Earth, and uh, Professor uh, Jelko Andrich from the University of Zagreb, shown here, at the top of the School of uh, uh, mining, mining and Oil faculty, has a little gizmo here. It's a little box made out of plastic. Inside, he has a sky quality meter, and he monitors. He's been monitoring this for many years. Actually, an article about him showed up in the news. That's how I got to know him. But he's got this measure, and he takes it down to his computer and reads the data. It's an example how you can measure light pollution quantitatively. You can qualitatively get to see things from simply photographic um, uh, photographs that you made overnight. And here's a, a photograph for, uh, that was made, um, God, I forgot the gentleman's name, but it was West Pointing night photograph of Tichan, that's, that's the observatory in Tichan, in Vishnyan, in Istria. And uh, you can see on the right side, the light comes from Trieste, and this is Porich on the left side here. You could also do this from space. 
There are satellites that specifically do that. Uh, well, not, that's not the only thing they do. They do many other things, but they also measure light pollution because most of the satellites take pictures during the day. Very few, and these in particular, take pictures during the night. And so there is the SUOMI, National Polar Orbiting Partnership, and then this NOAA, these are two different satellites. So the purpose of this satellite were to acquire informa acquiring information on atmospheric temperature, moisture, clouds, and so on, for purposes of light fire detection. And there's something called VIRST, which is the, um, where does it say? Ah, here it is, Visible Infrared Imaging Radiometer Suite. That is, that VIRST actually generates the data uh, during the night, so you can see how much light is coming off from the, during the night. And when you do a composite image, you get this image here. Maybe you don't see it very well, but in a presentation you will see uh, how much light is coming up from the Earth. Now, the, the important thing is that uh, you, here you just know there's light coming. You actually don't know what's the source of that light. And we are particularly interested that there is a, there is a revolution in lightning going on for the last 20, 10, 20 years is that all the incandescent and high pressure uh, discharge lamps are being replaced by LEDs. So we had to change the metrics that we look at when we buy bulbs. What are the metrics? Uh, we need to look at the spectrum. How does the, uh, the, the blue light coming out of LEDs uh, influence animals, humans around? So we had to change the metrics, and one of the things that we don't know from this picture and is going to be topic for our research is how many of these lights here are actually from LEDs and how many are from uh, incandescent lamps and uh, high density discharge or high discharge lamps. So speaking of metrics, the key metrics for illuminating sources are luminous efficiency at a new which is a measure of the efficiency of conversion of electrical energy that comes into watts, in watts, into luminous flux, which is lumens. And so if you look at, you can actually measure this, compute this for any light source by dividing the luminous flux specified for the light by the electrical power. So you go over here and it says 806 lumens. And you find somewhere else, it says nine watts. See right there, it says nine watts. There it says 806 lumens. Well, that is 90 lumens per watt. Excellent. Very good, because your, in, your halogen lamp is a lot worse than that. This is an LED lamp, right? But let's look at this. There's another metric is color rendering index, which means how good is this uh, when you compare the bulb how good is it relative to the sun or to an incandescent uh, halogen lamp, for example, right? So by definition, modern halogen lamp in E227, E27 base is 17 lumens per watt, but it's by definition has 100% color uh, rendering index. It means it's really white light, especially if the power is high and you can reconstruct colors. This is the type of, the type of illumination you want in your kitchen, so you know what you're cooking type of illumination you will see in art galleries because you want to see the exact color. Now, today's uh, nominally white LED bulb today, you can get them, as I showed, 90 lumens per watt, which is a lot more efficient, but it's a little bit less color rendering index. So the color rendering index is really what you should be looking at when you buy LEDs. They're, they are really efficient. Um, but he, here's the problem. We can make very efficient lamps. Low pressure sodium is a lot more efficient, double the efficiency, almost double the efficiency of an LED, but it's only yellow light. So the color rendering is minus 44 according to the method that people use to measure. So they're no longer legal. The, the, the um, low pressure sodium lamps used to, used to uh, city of Zagreb had lots of them down on, on uh, Vukovarska, but that was, that was long ago. They are no longer legal. You actually can't even buy them in Croatia even more. So um, the final third metric, which is <clears throat> interesting, is the color correlated temperature. You can, <clears throat> if it's at 2700 Kelvin, that's like a black body at 2700 Kelvin. Um, 
it's kind of yellowish you can use that in your living room but you can maybe use these 550 kelvin which is kind of whitish you use those in your bathroom now cct is defined by the proximity of the light sources chromato chromaticity coordinate coordinates to the black body emission locus that is an equivalent temperature those are three metrics that one should look at so i'm i'm telling you this so you get some acquaintance with what's going on out there with the um, public illumination and it's all done with solid state lighting now solid state lighting is a technical term for led lighting right they are more efficient they are less toxic they have as i said key advantage that they have high luminous efficiency you can adjust the color rendering index uh, you get a better color rendering index than most of the high discharge lamps uh, and you will see the spectra later in the presentation. Solid state lighting has also brought on a number of problems and that is that you have lots of blue light because, and I'll explain to you how that works, and this is all falls into the category of how are we going to measure, figure out whether it's an LED or a discharge lamp, right? So white LEDs are hybrid semiconductor devices. There is no semiconductor that emits white light. So let, 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 let's, let's, not, let's clarify that up at the beginning. The way you do it is white LEDs essentially consist of a blue LED con covered with yellow lumin luminophore, or we call that phosphor, or luminophore is, a, is the proper term. So the principle of operation is the fraction of the blue light is absorbed in the yellow luminophore. It emits yellow, re-emitted as yellow light, which is called phosphorescence. <clears throat> which is combined with a transmitter blue light which is luminescence and you get something that looks like white light blue and yellow equals white so this principle of operation is actually identical to the conventional fluorescent lamps with the difference that um, when low pressure mercury vapor emits at 250 nanometers which is UVC it's ultraviolet it hits a white emitting luminophore where white luminophore absorbs all of that light and gets out white light from from um, fluorescent light so the principle is the same except that you now use both the blue and the yellow to adjust your color temperature so here's the spectra well let's start first with how it's made you have a substrate oh, here here is a heat conducting block it could be a copper alloy copper moly or anything like that. Here's silicon. On top of that, you have active layer for blue light. Aluminum gallium nitride, light emitting p-n junction emits blue light here. And on top of that, you smear yellow luminophore. And when this runs, it creates what goes out is a spectrum that looks like this. There's blue and there's yellow. Together, they make white. Let me show you what these things look like inside. Here is an actual cut uh, through, through, a, through a commercial light emitting yellow, oh, sorry, white light emitting diode. You have this is parallel to bond wires right here. So it is a metal, metal. Here is, uh, this is silicon. Excuse me, this is some kind of a, actually I don't even know what that is. It's probably, con it's not conductive, it's ceramic. Here's silicon. On top of silicon is gallium nitride. When you look at it from the top, there is a, uh, there is a lens that's made out of a polycarbonate lens. So how do you get that white light? Is you look at the chromaticity diagram in the CIE, and you have a yellow luminophore somewhere here, and you have a blue light here. And then if you, if you combine the right amount of each, you can get something that's completely white right there. So with the ratio of the two, the bits on how thick is your yellow, you can get different colors, right? So notice that cool white will have, this is spectrum, energy, this is intensity, an arbitrary unit. If it's very white, that means there's a lot of blue. So yellow and lots of blue, that's six and, six and a half thousand Kelvin, it's very white light. As you progress to day white and warm white, Notice that there's more yellow and less blue. And those are sold as uh, 3,000 or 4,000 Kelvin. So the red part of the spectrum is here, green is here, and blue is here. 
So I will end here with light pollution um, and just wanted to explain to you what the white LEDs look like. I'm going to move on to the, ID, to the ozone measurements now. Ozone measurements are based on the Dobson interferometer and the idea is here is the Dobson interferometer which measures light coming from the sun and hitting the surface. Now Dobson interferometer uses two wavelengths and looks at the difference between absorption in, uh, of different two UV um, wavelengths and from that ratio it can determine the thickness, the total integrated amount of ozone between the sun and the surface. You can also do the same thing with having a satellite sitting out here and when the satellite can either look at the transmission through the... Oh my, this is a little bit strange picture because imagine the satellite is somewhere here where, where the sun is passing through the atmosphere and you're capturing it. That's one. Or the satellite is capturing light that's reflected from the face of the Earth. In both cases, you can adjust this method to, you, to determine the amount of ozone. So our target here was to develop a simple optical technique suited for a nanosatellite to measure the thickness of the ozone layer. We are going to try to use a pure B, uh, a pure B uh, photo detector that can measure um, the UV light. So uh, the method here is basically the Dobson spectrophotometer um, implemented. Here are some pictures. Here is a pure B detector and the printed circuit boards with the uh, dual transimpedance amplifier. The idea here is the ozone measurements. Oh, yeah, uh, the amount of ozone, how much is it in the space? Well, here it's maybe a little bit hard to see. This is attitude, altitude. This is from the surface of the Earth going out. Here are mountains, here are airplanes, mesosphere, there's, there's, uh, there's Branson's spaceship, right? At 100 kilometers. That is the density. You integrate this surface, this it's surface of this graph is the column, is the, the value which is integral of that is the column of ozone. The idea is that ozone, um, the, uh, that ozone ad absorbs a certain amount of, uh, the, the, it's wavelength dependent absorption. So you tie with two v different wavelengths, you can, in the ratio, how much thickness there is, you can determine the uh, total column of ozone. Um, let me move another topic. Uh, satellite build is an inter interdisciplinary engineering project. There's a lot of interesting things, um, and here is an example. Uh, that um, you will hear more about uh, in the lecture of uh, uh, Professor Launchar. This is a, um, a test system for attitude control and determination. Uh, determination and control. So there's going to be a demonstration of attitude determination control principles, lots of mathematical modeling, building the hardware and control electronics, including building a 3D, 3D printed devices. Low noise UV light detector block the term, uh, consists of low noise transimpedance amplifiers. Finally, satellite uh, camera, camera color calibration, which uh, one of the students is working on. This is actually the camera that we're going to be putting onto the satellite, a 5 megapixel. Here are measurements uh, with LEDs, different LEDs. I'm going to show you this. This is quite interesting. Um, we did measurements of, or I should say, the student, Leonardo, made these measurements with a uh, light emitting diode was emitting light. Here's a fiber that goes into a spectrometer. That's one measurement. Number me measurement two is a commercial chroma, uh, chromometer. It measures the, directly measures, or it's calibrated to measure chromaticity coordinates. And here's our camera with the lens taken off. The lens has the IR, cam, uh, IR filter. And the side view of that same measurement, see here the true sen two, three sensing, uh, and here's the LED that's powered. We use that for 15, I don't know how many I have here, large number of LEDs. Each one of them has its own color. And we want to calibrate the camera with I don't even know how many, you have to count how many, 15 LEDs. 
and you look at what chromaticity points do you get for some of these and you know, notice that for pure color as you would expect you get the wavelengths right at the edge of the chromaticity diagram right here some of them don't fall in here the, the reasons are understood it's not a problem this one is also moved from the edge although it's a clear color also understood reason I don't want to get into the details to explain to you but th these are th this is basically a, an interesting problem to solve it's going to be very useful in the final camera program um, another student was is still working on a program to image what does a satellite see this is a good problem you imagine you're traveling with your satellite and you have a camera in your hand and you know the specifications of your camera what's the lens how many pixels and you are flying on that satellite in the direction of travel you look ahead and say okay I'm gonna move the camera down sideways this way towards the earth what is the camera gonna see what is the video gonna see if I were to take a video of that event what is it gonna look like um, here is th this is in progress work right this is the the uh, satellite orbit and the camera is sitting there looking down exactly and these are pixels actually so you get, you get to see how they distort or if you look at the sideways they, they will distort and here all the distortion shown in here using the same program you can determine uh, what the sa what um, what are the footprints of satellites like for example here this is a footprint for a for a geostationary satellite as HIL-2 uh, and to end this presentation um, you will hear more about the ground station I um, just wanted to bring your attention to the fact that two years ago students were using Yagi antennas and, um, and uh, software-defined radio uh, USB plugs in here to hear uh, International Space Station it can be done from like with this and with this antenna today we have a uh, professional setup where we actually have a tracker tracker VHF antenna UHF antenna and here's assistant Vukovic who's going to talk about that today uh, what is interesting is that there, there's a lot of work here a lot of software work to prepare the, the, some things have been done there's a software to figure out where the satellite is and then point the antenna towards that place. So when the satellite passes over Zagreb, then we know how to track it. Number two, there's software is being built and that software is to how, how do you uh, program the satellite. While it's passing by, you need to tell the satellite, I want you to take a picture over Rio de Janeiro, right? That is happening at that time and you want, uh, you want to point it in a certain direction or you need to tell it five hours or ten hours ahead of time that to take pictures of the aurora borealis so that scheduler that program that does that needs to be written it's in progress but there's a lot of things to do so finally uh, the students who are participating in this project have been they've been going to conferences they've been popularizing their work and the science so here is an image from a satellite workshop in uh, Dubrovnik that happened two years ago. It was great fun for everyone. So uh, I'm going to end with a list of 40 individuals at the time, that at this time, are participating or have been participating in this project. And that is, that is the end of this overview. Thank you. Possibly one of the first questions asked when designing a satellite is, but what does the satellite do? The goal behind launching a satellite into the more and more populated globe of orbit is commonly described with a satellite mission plan. As such, our plan is to measure light, which is radiated from the Earth into space, to determine two things. First is the ozone layer thickness, and second, is the nighttime light pollution caused by solid-state lighting and conventional discharge lamps. We would like to differentiate two cases of light emission from the Earth, as they differ greatly in the radiant power emitted. The first case is during daytime, when sunlight reflects from the surface of the Earth and reaches the imaging optics of the satellite. 
The second case is during nighttime, during which sunlight is not present, but the light of public illumination light sources reflects from the surface of the Earth and again reaches the imaging optics of the satellite. The nighttime radiant power can be a thousand times smaller than during the daytime, making it a difficult task to measure it. Currently, nighttime satellite data is available from the VIRS instrument on the internet. However, this data is limited to wavelengths between 500 and 900 nanometers. It does not capture blue light emitted by public illumination sources at wavelengths below 500 nanometers. Blue light is dominant in light LEDs and can be harmful to the human circadian rhythm. This image shows the spectra of four public illumination light sources, and we can see that the LEDs have by far the most blue light in their emission spectra. Measuring nighttime light is challenging. The nighttime light is a mixture of incoherent light. The number of different spectra radiated is practically unlimited due to many different manufacturers producing light sources. Light is reflected from the ground and attenuated by the atmosphere before it reaches space. Nighttime radiant power can be more than 1,000 times smaller when compared to daytime radiant power. Is it possible that we can measure a nighttime light using a simple camera? Uh, this photograph, taken from the International Space Station, shows the city of Berlin and the difference in the color in West and East Berlin. The difference comes from East Berlin using sodium lamps, whereas the West uses white light emitting light sources. It's important to note that the color can reveal the mechanism of producing the light which is, in this case, the light sources. We explored this idea further and show an unsupervised image segmentation method that we have developed. The original image on the left is segmented into three different regions, as shown in the image on the right. The regions are for LED illumination, sodium light, and the dark blue color represents darkness. An RGB camera, therefore, can be used when a single light source is present, or when the spatial resolution of the camera and imaging subsystem is large. However, this requires large imaging optics, which is the problem for 1U CubeSats. As such, we present an alternative way to differentiate light sources, which is by using a spectrometer. Spectrometers consist of a linear pixel array and a diffraction grating. Although spectrometers are being used on satellites, due to the low efficiency and the need for large imaging optics, spectrometers are not practical for 1U CubeSats. Using a spectrometer, we have experimentally shown that it is possible to unmix a mixture of light into the constituent spectra. A spectrometer has a large number of pixels, uh, sometimes in the, a few thousands of them. And we have shown that we can reduce the number of pixels required to unmix the mixture of light. This image shows an example of such optical filters required to reduce the number of pixels. Using in-depth Monte Carlo simulations, we have designed a practical set of optical filters uh, which will allow us to use filter detectors instead of sp a spectrometer on a one new cube set to unmix the nighttime light. To this end, we have designed a prototype Q 
CubeSat payload, which will allow us to measure both daytime UV light and the nighttime light. The first set payload consists of two parts. First is the light measurement subsystem, and second is the payload data handler, which controls the subsystem and interacts with the rest of the satellite. Th these two images show the printed circuit board that we have designed for our payload data handler. The board includes a camera interface, a power supply conversion subsystem, and a memory storage subsystem, and a microcontroller for onboard mission control. The following image shows the print circuit board that we have designed for our light measurement subsystem. The board consists of a digital interface for measuring the analog signals corresponding to the amount of light received on the detectors. Additionally, we have developed several circuit boards for testing and measuring the optical and electrical properties of the light measurement subsystem. These printed circuit boards are shown on the image, on the images. Uh, to conclude our description of the payload, the daytime UV and nighttime light measurements are challenging. We have developed an unmixing algorithm. We have demonstrated it experimentally and theoretically using a spectrometer. We have designed a set of optical filters and demonstrated them in a simple Monte Carlo analysis. We have designed the onboard payload control printed circuit board and the payload light measurement print circuit board. We are currently in the process of writing the embedded software and testing our prototype. This concludes the payload description. Thank you for listening. Hello, dear viewers, and welcome to my presentation. My name is Jurica, and I am working on mechanical design and thermal analysis of one new Fairset satellite. In the next couple of minutes, I will talk about my contribution to FERSA project. In this presentation, you will see mechanical design of R1U CubeSat, consisting of the bus and FERSAT payload module uh, we are developing. Besides that, I will try to explain why is thermal analysis important for successful work of the satellite. This is the good point to mention that I am using the SOLIDWORKS program in which I design the layout of elements of payload and with the help of simulation I am trying to determine how will our satellite behave in the extreme thermal conditions it will be exposed to in space. On this slide you can also see the standard skeleton of 1U CubeSat and next to it our design used for 3D printing. In design, we must follow the specification of Cal Poly University, where in 1999 was the first CubeSat made. NASA also follows that design. We are limited with space because one new satellite has the volume of 1 liter and it cannot be heavier than 1.33 kilo kilograms. Uh, design of the satellite must be such that the center of the mass must not be more than 2 cm more away from the uh, geometric center to avoid unwanted tumbling of the satellite when in orbit. As I mentioned before, FERSAT is composed of payload module we are developing and from, from the bus. Currently, in FERSAT project, we are considering of using bus uh, developed by German orbital systems or by Space Manic. The satellite itself will be smaller than 10 times 10 times 10 centimeters, and of the total volume, we get only 20% of the space to install our payload elements. Our payload module mainly consists of three boards, outer port or X-band board, 
middle board or sensor board, and inner board or PDH board. In exploded view, you can see that patch antenna, uh, antennas are planned on outer board. We are using middle board as a support for light pollution detectors with filters. Camera is one of the planned payloads, and unwanted satellite rollover would make it very difficult to observe wanted objects on Earth's surface. So our mission is to find optimal layout of payload elements to minimize CubeSat tumbling in orbit. In design process, we encountered a problem with camera dimensions. In this case, uh, there is always a part of first set camera that is protruding in the bus. After thermal analysis, we removed camera's heat sink and camera was still 5 mm too long. In the conversation with companies responsible for bus development, we found out that some of bus components can be reallocated and as consequence payload will fit and will not interfere with bus components. Besides mechanical ana analysis and design, a uh, critical point of uh, satellite development is also thermal analysis. Thermal analysis is one of the key elements of design of any satellite because there must be a balance of internal and external heating and cooling factors in order, to, uh, in order for the satellite components to be in the temperature range in which they work best. As we know, most electronics work best in the temperature range of 0 to 25 degrees Celsius and satellite in a orbit of 500 kilometers above the Earth's surface will be exposed to a high temperature gradient of a couple hundred degrees. The whole design uh, has to allow normal operation of the satellite. That means that overheating of any individual components of the satellite is unwanted. On one side, we want control rotation of satellite because that prevents the sun from burning one side of the satellite. So rotation achieves that the sun hits all the surfaces of the satellite almost equally, like playing the game of hot potatoes in orbit. On the other side, un uncontrolled rotation and tumbling are unwanted because they would make recording of the Earth's surface very difficult, uh, almost impossible. On the last slide of my presentation, I present you uh, an example of thermal, sim thermal simulation in SOLIDWORKS. Uh, except external heat sources, we must consider a potential internal heat source. For example, chip operating with power of a couple of watts. So we are asking ourselves how much heat will generate a chip of 3 watt power in one of the boards. On, on one of the boards. Thermal simulation study in SOLIDWORKS can answer that and as you can see, a uh, chip with 3 watt power heats up itself for only a couple of degrees. So uh, this level of power is not uh, causing any problems in our, uh, in our design. In this short presentation, I presented to you my contribution to FERSET project, and I hope you enjoyed it. At the very end, I would like to thank you for your attention, and I have to thank to the all contributors who are working on FERSET project. Thank you. Hello, uh, my name is Josip Loncher. I'm an assistant professor at the Department of Communication and Space Technologies at FER, and I'm a team lead of the ADCS group. Uh, today, I will present our recent progress in the ADCS development. First of all, uh, let me say a few words about the ADCS. ADCS stands for Attitude Determination and Control System. It is one of the most complex subsystems of a spacecraft, responsible for pointing accuracy and stability of spacecraft payloads and antennas. As such, it is basically unavoidable in most of the modern satellite missions. Usually it consists of several PCBs populated with a processor, 
various sensors for the attitude estimation and actuators for the attitude control, as you can see in this figure. Currently, there are three active student members in the group who did a great job in the ADCS development. They are Karla Sever, Ivan Vnucic, and Ivan Indir. Although there are some commercially available ADCS systems that you can buy and integrate into your satellite, our goal is to develop a fully functional ADCS at FAIR. But more importantly, we would like to develop a wide set of skills required in space industry, but in industry in general as well. These skills include, but are not limited to electronics and PCB design, embedded programming, linear algebra, sensor fusion, automatic control, and optimization. During the last couple of years, we developed a lot of components of the ADCS system and its verification setup. For example, here you can see the spherical air bearing that we have designed and 3D printed. It emulates low friction present in the orbit by creating a thin film of compressed air between the bearing and the transparent sphere containing our ADCS model in development. This approach allows full rotational freedom around all three orthogonal axes. However, to simplify the challenge, for starters, we restricted the rotation of, to only one degree of freedom by lowering the center of mass of the satellite model below the geometrical center of the sphere. Here you can see the demonstration of our first implemented algorithm called detumbling. Its purpose is to reduce unwanted rotation of the satellite that occurs during the launch into orbit. Based on the angular velocity measurements from a gyroscope, we implemented the PAD control of a DC motor that drives a flywheel. This approach is based on the principle of conservation of angular momentum. We still keep adding and removing stuff from our CubeSat model, which changes its uh, moment of inertia, and because of that, the PAD control is not optimal, which manifests in overshoot that you can see in the graph. However, this is not an issue since the final optimization of the PAD control comes down to fine-tuning the three constants in over the implemented code. With the implemented PAD control for the detoubling, it is quite straightforward to control angular velocity of our CubeSat model. As you can see from this demonstration, the implemented controller allows control of both the angular speed and the direction of rotation. Following the same approach, the PAD control of angle of rotation is implemented as well. So far, I have shown you the demonstration of an ADCS based on a flywheel powered by a DC motor as an actuator and a gyroscope as a sensor for the attitude estimation. However, we didn't stop there. Our recent activities include the design of a magnet torquer and development of an iterative algorithm for 3D attitude estimation based on multiple sensor observations. A magnet torquer is an uh, electromagnetic actuator for attitude control of nanosatellites. Basically, it's a coil that exhibits magnetic dipole moment when you pass an electric current through it. The created magnetic dipole moment interacts with the local magnetic field, such as the Earth's magnetic field, creating a torque that causes satellite to rotate. We decided to design two orthogonal magnet torquers for one new cube set. This allows us to create magnetic dipole moment vector in any direction in horizontal plane and achieve attitude control around vertical axis. Here you can see all the design parameters and equations that govern magnet torquer's magnetic dipole moment, power consumption, mass, and volume. Our goal was to design optimal magnet torquers that exhibit required magnetic dipole moment while minimizing mass and power consumption. Uh, the design of optimal magnet torquers is crucial uh, due to the strict mass constraints of standard CubeSat formats and limited power budget. However, this is easier said than done since minimized mass and power consumption represent opposing requirements. Thus, we used multi-objective optimization tools based on the genetic algorithms available in MATLAB optimization toolbox. Here you can see the results of the optimization. Uh, we 3D printed the magnet worker frames and winded the copper wire using an in-house developed winding machine. 
the preliminary resistance measurements are in close agreement with the calculated values within 3%, which is very promising. But to fully benefit from the optimal magnet torquers, we still need to design highly efficient digitally controlled magnet torquer drivers, which will be the subject of our future research efforts. In addition to optimization and prototyping of magnet torquers, our most recent research efforts were dedicated to the development of an iterative method for 3D attitude estimation based on the gradient, gradient descent method. Without going into details, here you can see the results of these simulations. Uh, the algorithm converges within the first several seconds of the simulation, after which the estimated rotation quaternion and Euler angles are in close agreement with the actual attitude. Here you can take a closer look at the results. The key takeaway is that the iterative algorithm allows us to make compromise between the computational load and accuracy of attitude estimation. This allows us to simply adjust the algorithm according to the mission requirements and computational resources through several parameter values. Here you can see a quick demonstration of our algorithm. The estimated attitude is still quite noisy due to the acceleration and magnetic field measurements based on a low-cost inertial measurement unit. However, keep in mind that these sensors are still not fused with the gyroscope. Our preliminary results of the implemented uh, complementary filter show that the noise can be reduced significantly, which we will be studying uh, in detail further on. Our work resulted in three international conference papers. Two of them will be presented this summer. There is still a lot of work that needs to be done. Uh, we have already started to design a high efficiency digitally controlled magnet or driver. There is also implementation of complementary or Kalman filter for 3D attitude estimation, PID control of magnet torquers, DC uh, motor desaturation, 3D attitude control, all kinds of simulations, and many more. Uh, before I end my presentation, I would like to thank uh, Tonko Barac and Krotel Deo for their support of our work. And finally, thank you for your attention. If you have any questions or would like to join our team, feel free to contact me. Uh, here's my email address. Stay safe and take care. Hello, I'm Josip Vukovic and I will talk about the Fersat ground station. We have a team that consists of three groups uh, of people. Uh, one group is the faculty of electrical engineering and computing staff. Uh, the other group are the students and the third group are the employees of the Ultima uh, company. Uh, all of us work on different aspects of the Fersat ground station. So why would, why would anyone need a ground station for a satellite? Uh, well, we somehow have to transfer data from the satellite to Earth and the other way around. So uh, ground stations are used uh, for sending data towards satellites and these data are commands, the software updates and the user data. And in the opposite direction, we have the telemetry and the payload data. The telemetry are the information on the sensors and the satellite status, and the payload data are the useful data collected by the satellite. So in each of these directions, we need to somehow send the information towards the Earth. So we can have large ground station like this one, or extremely basic like this handheld antenna. And uh, somehow we need to find the balance uh, depending on the application and the frequency uh, range uh, used for the purpose. Uh, the first at the ground station has several roles. One of them is the education of students in the satellite uh, technologies, so the ground station development. As this project is intended to popularize space technologies and satellite technologies, uh, we intended uh, to develop uh, different aspects of the ground station together with students. Also, 
the frequencies used are in the communication with the satellite, and the purpose of the satellite is the radio amateur uh, purpose. So uh, the frequencies will, will be the amateur radio frequencies, and the students will be uh, more involved in the uh, amateur radio uh, community, therefore enabling the radio, uh, radio amateur community uh, to grow stronger at the faculty. And uh, the third, third role of the ground station is the communication with uh, low Earth orbit satellites. Those are the satellites orbiting around five to 600 kilometers above the Earth's surface. And if they use the same frequencies as uh, supported by our ground station, uh, we would be able to communicate with them. This is also important in the period of testing the ground station before the FERSAT is launched. And finally, we would use the ground station to communicate with FERSAT satellite. Uh, about the location of the station, uh, we decided to uh, develop it uh, and to put it here uh, on FER for easier supervision and the maintenance. So this, this would be a convenient location for such a ground station. Also, uh, we would like to have an unobstructed sky view to be able to track the satellite in all the uh, azimuths and elevations. So a uh, tall building with uh, no, 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 not too many obstructions uh, around would be very useful. And FAIR has such a building. And also, it would be good to uh, locate the antenna site and the receiver close to each other so that the uh, cable loss would be as low as possible. Besides that hardware we talk about, the antenna, uh, we also need the software component of the station, and I will talk about that a bit later. So here we can see the first ground station, and this is the rooftop hardware. And uh, here we can see that on the top of the fair building, uh, there is a site for this uh, antenna and the rotator. The antennas are the VHF and the UHF, both WIMO x quad antennas, uh, with the elements perpendicular to each other, so that we can receive uh, the signal in any polarization, which is very important in the uh, tumbling phase of the satellite's life at it, uh, just after it is launched. And uh, so VHF uses the uh, 144 to 146 MHz frequency range, and the UHF the 435 to 438 uh, MHz. They are located on a, on a pole uh, inside the rotator that can rotate on the elevation so can track the satellite from the horizon towards the zenith and again towards the horizon, and also spin around the, the azimuth to track the satellite appearing at the horizon in any point. Uh, these antennas in the rotator are through the cables connected to the control room situated on the 13th floor just beneath the the antenna. And uh, in the next slide, we can see the control room hardware. Here is the rotator controller that is also connected to the computer. Then the transceiver that supports both the UHF and VHF. And the computer that is connected to the transceiver and to the uh, antenna uh, rotator, and also to the internet so that we can uh, run all the software remotely and also connect, uh, connect from different sites uh, to control the satellite. So what are the functions of such a ground station? Uh, first of all, we would need real-time satellite orbit calculation to determine the location on the of the satellite on the sky. Then when we know the location of the satellite, we need to steer the antennas 
in that direction to be able to receive the signals. When we are directed towards the satellite and able to receive those signals, then we collect, collect the signals, so the telemetry and other uh, data sent by satellites. And we are also able to transfer the data in the opposite direction, so send commands to uh, some of the satellites. Also, it would be good for such software to have the mission simulation to be able to predict different aspects of the mission, uh, turning on and off uh, subsystems of the satellite, and uh, checking the battery state status, etc. And uh, for, for missions such as FERSAT, the, pub the relation to the public is very important because of the uh, popularization of the technology, so the public mission status data should also be provided online. Here we can see a schematic of the software functions. So we have the access to the uh, NORAD two-line element, which is the orbital data collected by the ground stations of the uh, uh, American uh, NORAD system. Such orbital information are uh, received to the simulation, to the offline simulation part of the software, which is yet to be developed, and to the mission controls, uh, control software that is par uh, currently under development and partially developed. Uh, once we have the tool and element about the satellite location, we can, as we said, rotate the antennas towards the satellite. That is determined also in the operational scheduler because we can track multiple satellites simultaneously, and uh, the schedule would tell us in which direction to turn the antenna at which moment, and to which frequency uh, the transceivers should switch. Also, during the pass, as the satellite moves, the Doppler shift is also calculated. So once we have the antenna pointing towards the satellite, we can uh, receive or send data uh, in the uh, UHF and VHF. And such data are usually uh, using the AX25 uh, protocol for the communication. And uh, such data are received and stored. Also, we can send con control commands using the same protocol and the same transceiver. In order to determine which satellites should be tracked, which data should be sent to the satellite, and at what time. Uh, we need the authorized user uh, in interaction with the software. And therefore, this uh, box here, authorized user interface, uh, which is uh, currently develop being developed and uh, as a web application. Also, a public web uh, for the status and uh, amateur radio access for those who want to communicate with our satellite. Offline simulations are important for scenario testing and the optimization of the usage of different components uh, of the satellite, and their battery drain, uh, compared to the uh, sun uh, that would charge the batteries, that would uh, generate the heat uh, in the components, so we have to uh, make balance of the temperature in the satellite, and therefore uh, decide which uh, subsystem activate uh, to activate at what time. And when we are uh, satisfied with the results, uh, this simulation would go to the operational schedule and this communication uh, would be established. So now more of the technical view. Mm, the basics under the, the basic presumption is to use the, uh, the open source software. So we are using the CentOS 7 GNU Linux uh, and the Open VPN, Nginx web server, and PostgreSQL 13 database. The Hamlig uh, software package is uh, used uh, for the communication with the rotator and uh, uh, Direwolf uh, to, uh, to uh, communicate with AX25 uh, protocol. The Star Trek uh, API was developed based on the external REST service to acquire the NORAD TLE data 
and uh, calculate the Doppler shift. And then uh, the Sancho component was developed also to be uh, used for scheduling a satellite tracking. Rotator shell controls the rotator manually or, uh, in, or by batch, but this is ma mainly for the testing. And currently, the uh, Ultima uh, software, the Icarus administrator interface web application, is being developed. So, thank you for your attention. I hope you have seen some parts of the uh, ground station development that is happening here at FAIR. Uh, in collaboration with our partners at uh, Ultima Software that are also volunteering at this project. So we have a community of people who are interested in uh, satellite technologies uh, and are aware that without the ground station that would control the satellite and be the brain uh, of the whole operation, uh, the satellite project would not be possible. Thank you. Okay, so the last presentation is I would like to bring your attention to another development in our department and at FAIR, and that is the establishment of a profile related to communication and space technologies. So the purpose of this very short few slides is to show you what has been done here and what is the motivation in space technology at FAIR in this year. So space industry is uh, rapidly growing, as, as you've seen, and there's a lot of beautiful things that are happening. Both, uh, both the, the space tourism, which has been recently um, so nicely promoted by, by uh, Richard Branson, uh, by flying out to the edge of the atmosphere. Uh, but there are also other things. You know, uh, you've heard of Spacelink, uh, Skylink, sorry, Skylink, Skylink by SpaceX. Uh, which is, uh, uh, which is um, internet or satellite internet from, the, from an altitude of about 550 kilometers. So our mission objectives, in light of the fact that space has become accessible, are first, there are jobs in Europe for, for people who want to work, for engineers and physicists and so on, uh, who want to work in space industry. There are definitely jobs. We, we know that because we get phone calls. Uh, so our, our plan is to pair engineers and scientists of all fields, so you're welcome to come, for a career in space industry. Now let me just warn you, the space industry doesn't mean you're going to go to space. You're going to be working on electronics, physics, software, uh, communications technology, all with the application in space. Some of you might make it to space, I don't know. Number two, our objective, or mission objective, is science. We would like to provide some scientific and technological contribution with the goal of improving the environment and supporting sustainability. That's actually what we're doing right now with our um, payload. But uh, there's, there's different reasons here, right? If we provide scientific and technological um, contribution, we can positively affect small business enterprises, startups, small companies in Europe and in Croatia. That is the ultimate goal, right? That, that these, right now, people who want to work in space industry might just take off and go to EU. But the ultimate goal is that they stay here and that they build small companies that do something for space industry or communications industry in Croatia here. So those are, the, those are our objectives. So how are we going to get there? Well, there's three things. First is space technology education, space science, spacecraft, system engineering, and practical experiences in building a nanosatellite. That is what we're providing with the FERSAT program. Students can elect a major in communications and or space technology at FAIR. We have a profile that's communications and space technology. Second, scientific and engineering interests manifest themselves in exploring a number of observational payloads, right? So observational payload is we're going to look at Earth and find out something that maybe other people haven't looked at, right? There's lots of ideas daily happening. People are starting companies or starting projects to do those observations. 
Uh, and we, we are going to develop measurement instrumentation. Okay, we're engineers. We develop instrumentation. We develop products. So you're going to develop something that's going to go onto a satellite or a balloon or something. Or it's going to go on a plane or something like, of that sort that's going to be useful to monitoring some function that people would be interested in. You know, for right now, we, are se we selected ozone and we selected light pollution. There's a good, there's a great demonstrators, but that's not the end. We're just starting to scratch the surface of what can be done and what useful information we can get from space. So, um, and that finally creates intellectual property, patents, trade secrets. We want that. The third part is launching a nanosatellite, the, the one U CubeSat that we call FERSAT, within with a scientific payload. This will be FERS first satellite, but certainly not the last. I mean, we once we get into this, things are gonna we're gonna rock. Um, but I, I want to I want to caution you again that it makes sense to set, to push a satellite into space. That will do something very something useful business-wise or science-wise, right? At this moment, we're doing science-wise. We will do business as well. So why communication and, and uh, space technologies? Why, why are we interested in this? Uh, why are we marrying those two, actually? If you think about it, look at without efficient communication, wireless communications, uh, there would be no space industry. I mean, we. You know, you would send things out to space and then, and then you would have no benefit out of that. You couldn't talk to it. Whatever the satellite you sent could not send any information to Earth. So why would you do it? And, and it would move very, the, the whole idea would not work very well. So communications technologies and space technologies, they're, they're married permanently. You need, to have, you need to understand both to be able to make spacecraft and so on. So, to a large extent, present-day growth in space technology investment, what we're seeing with Skylink and so on, wouldn't happen if it wasn't for the communications aspect, right? Because deployment is driven by the need for global communications. That's what Elon Musk is doing with uh, SpaceX, right? And Earth observation, which is communicate, communicated to the Earth. Earth observation, observation is enormous business. So quality of satellites and quality of communication is becoming, once again, of top priority. And so let me offer you two things that, that, that are happening. You're aware of the fact that radio frequency communications technology or microwave technology is the vast majority of what, how we communicate with space vehicles. But something else is coming up to of age, and that is space optical communications technology. It's called free space. So maybe just illustrate to you what technologies are involved in here. Radio frequency communication technology, that is what the profile at this department will teach you. Antennas, signal propagation, high frequency electronics for transmission reception of signals. You learn about antennas, you learn about space propagation, and microwave electronics. Optical communications, on the other hand, we've already known for the last 50 years is happening through optical fibers. Your phone conversation, although it's wireless to the tower, beyond the tower, it's all terrestrial optical fibers because wireless cannot carry that. that uh, it's, it's technically unfeasible to create a system that would transport as much data as we need using wireless technology. You wouldn't have internet as you know it unless there was optical fibers. So that was what we knew up to recently. We knew of something called free space optical links and they were used occasionally. But they have issues with fog and, and uh, scintillation of the air, but not in space. So space to earth and spa satellite to satellite links this is what Skylink uses, actually. Our coming of age, this is the new technology. Actually, uh, I wouldn't say it was completely new, but it's very growing. There is a new application for it. There's, there's a tremendous amount of 
work that needs to still happen to get optical links to connect us from Earth to satellite, satellite to satellite. So those are two technological communication uh, areas that are of interest. And finally, there's space science, you know. In addition to FAIR's, FAIR's Department of Communications and, and um, Space Technologies, us here, we partnered with the uh, Department of Physics to create curriculum. And the last two slides I'm going to show you. Um, the curriculum, what do you get to learn uh, as an undergraduate if you take one course, there's only one course called the Introduction to Space Technology. And um, this is at the baccalaureate level. You get to learn in that one course, you get to learn orbits and astrodynamics, orbital maneuvers, space environment, global navigation, energy harvesting, storage, how do you create thermal balance at the satellite, or how do planets become thermally stable, spacecraft communications technology as an introduction, and an introduction to attitude determination and control. And finally, some word about Grant's ground segment. If you come into the uh, master's level after the, the uh, bachelor's, then there are many, many courses. Some are uh, mandatory, some are elective, but you get to uh, really learn about satellite communications and the nanosatellite communications technology, free space optical communications, energy power system, which is EPS for satellites, thermal design with more detail, attitude determination, radiation hardening, qualification, reliability concept, and then more detail discussing observational, uh, observational payloads. How do you work with cameras and so on? And finally, a lot more detailed story about ground segment. Um, these are not the only courses in the, uh, these are not the only courses in the profile. There are other things that you can take. But this pretty much tells you that if you're interested in space industry or core communications industry, this is a good, um, gives you a good background for that. So thank you for your attention. OK, so this is the end of our uh, set of presentations. Thank you for your attention. If you are interested to get more data, please contact uh, me or anybody else at the department. Come up here, visit the department. You can see. Uh, the, the labs, you can see what we're working on. Um, and uh, don't be shy. You, you, if you're first year, second year, third, fourth, or uh, just come up here. We will, there, there will always be something to work on. And um, I think it, that this work on Fersat is a good introduction to making a real product. And I'll explain to you why. Uh, Real, there, there are a lot of things that you will learn in industry and you start working on products. Uh, a satellite is an unusual kind of product because you have to build it and it has to work at once and that's the only one you're going to build. So it has to work when you deploy it. it. You cannot fly up there and fix it like you would fix a car. Or you can't reboot your computer to change a bug in the program. There's no such thing. This has to work that one time that it is deployed. So um, technologies you will learn will be things that will be useful in other fields because you get to learn optics, electronics, software that is all with the application in space but that doesn't mean it doesn't get applied everywhere else. In fact it does. So thank you for your attention. We're looking forward to seeing you. <laughs>